Um, so what can I do with a major in music? My name is Robin Crow. I'm in the um, Office of Career Internship and Student Employment Services. And Chantal Mahan mm -hmm. is putting this on. She's the employer coordinator. Um, so what we do in the career services office is our job is just to engage you in the career planning process. So this means self-assessment, um, the world of work, everything that you want to do. Um, so we're there to help you. And to meet that mission, we have a couple of different things that we provide. Um, first, we offer my cat careers. So if you guys are familiar with my cat careers, I highly recommend you go check it out. It is um, a jo our job listing website, so it posts all part-time work, full-time employment, um, and it's most importantly, internships. Um, and we also offer it for alumni, so after you graduate, you can still continue to use my tech career. So it's just a really easy way, especially if you're staying in Bozeman or Montana, a lot of local employers do post on my tech careers. Um, so if you're not going there, you're missing out on a huge chunk. But I highly recommend it. If you have any questions about it, come down and see me. Um, we also offer career coaching and advising, and so we have um, dedicated staff that actually will talk to you about um, if you're thinking about your, what you're going to do with your major, um, if you're changing directions, what you're going to do when you graduate. These are all awesome questions, and we have coaches that are here to help you figure that out, and obviously you can go as many times as you want. It doesn't cost you anything, and you get champ change. Um, they also offer resume critiques and mock interviews. These, obviously, you shouldn't... You should definitely go for resumes, no matter what. Um, if you have an interview coming up, I can't express how helpful mock interviews really are. They also can videotape them for you, which is incredibly helpful if you have no idea how to portray yourself. Um, it's, it's either peace of mind that you're doing great, or they'll tell you ways to fix it. So um, again, this is a, a good service for you. Um, we offer on-campus interviews, especially during career fairs. Um, employers do come and actually interview, come to campus and interview students, so they make it as easy as possible for you. So we coordinate that. Um, like I said, we offer a de-employment for alumni. After you graduate, if you're still having trouble finding a job, go ahead and use my tech careers. Um, and then we have career fairs, obviously, workshops like this and presentations. So um, this is how we like to think about um, the whole job process and career process in general. Um, the very first step, we really want you to think about who you are. You really shouldn't be starting out on your job search or even career I thoughts before you know who you are and what you want to be. That's incredibly important. And we have success coaches in the Office of Student Success that can help you with that, what motivates you, what your skills are, what you want, um, personality, accomplishments. All these things are really important. So figure that out first. Um, then you should go on to um, the world of work. So that is what you can possibly do in that field that you are thinking of. We all additionally have tons of sources that can help you with that, including like strong inventories, which really shows you. So it's a test that you can do and shows you what you like, what you don't like, and you might be surprised. I'm surprised when I took mine. Um, next step is goal setting. So this is: Do you want to do an internship? Says yes. Um, what type of path? Major, minor, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the very, very, very last part is the job search. If you go through all these steps, job search is going to be free. Um, if you go straight from self-assessment to job search, which sometimes people do, it's going to hurt. So um, we really recommend this circular process. And you could re go back to self-assessment at some point. So just keep that in mind um, in your college experience. I'm going to turn it over to Chantel, who will be directing the conversation. Let's just start with Matthew. And why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us about your career path. Where, how did you get to where you are now? Some of your I experiences. love that this series is called What to Do with a Major in Dot Dot Dot. Because <laughs> my undergraduate degree uh, from the Wigan Conservatory of Music was a degree in jazz studies, which coupled with an English degree might get you a job as a waiter at some restaurant. You know, I, mean, I was a drummer and I was a jazz player, um, but I caught the orchestral conducting bug, and, and so after, uh, so during my undergrad years, the school actually because it was a conservatory, uh, let me kind of restructure my curriculum and finish my jazz degree while studying mainly conducting. Um, I knew that uh, when I graduated from my undergrad degree, anyone who had financial aid had to attend a meeting in which they told us about how we had to pay our loans back and things like that. And at that meeting, they told us that less than 2% of graduates from top conservatories end up with a full-time living in music. This is in 1988, and I just spent $100,000 on a four-year bachelor's degree in 1988. And we were all thinking, oh, great, this is great. But I wanted to go into conducting, and I knew it was going to be very hard because of those odds, so I wanted to get to study with the best. And so I spent two years training just for my auditions for grad school. Uh, I did get 
where I wanted to go. I studied with a, a famous conductor named Gustav Meyer. He was at the time at the University of Michigan, which is great because Michigan is an awesome school. It's an awesome place to be. Uh, a after graduating, um, I went on the audition circuit, which is you send out about 400 resumes for each one response you get, typically. And occasionally you get an audition. And in our business, the audition circuit is you're invited uh, nobody comes to campus to interview you. You're, you're invited to an audition, you pay all your expenses yourself, you go, you might have 15 minutes to prove yourself, and then they say goodbye. And uh, so I was doing that. I did an international competition in Italy to try to build my uh, Europe credentials. Um, and then I, one of the auditions I actually won, which was the Bozeman Symphony. So I moved here when I was 27 and uh, started here. Um, sure, I had another orchestra for a while in Butte because when I first moved here, this job paid only $16,000 a year with no benefits. And at that point, I had about $180,000 in education to pay off. So that was tricky. So I took another job, which gave me about another ten grand a year. Uh, I'm grateful to say the Bozeman Symphony pays a lot more than that now, so it's, it paid off for me. But I did start it here, and then uh, about three years after I was here, um, I got courted by a management firm in New York City. Uh, called Parker Artists. I signed with them uh, after playing footsie with them for about a year and that started my guest conducting career in earnest because in addition to my two jobs I guest conduct which means I get hired by orchestras throughout the United States and in other countries and I fly in and I perform with them. Um, and that really was uh, paid off pretty well um, and then about six years, seven years ago I was guest conducting in Wyoming and about a month before I got there I got a call that their music director just resigned and they were interested in looking at me and would I be interested and I said, well, I'm going to be there, it's fine, we can talk. And, uh, and uh, after I conducted there, they offered me a job and I took it. So now I work in both Bozeman and Casper, Wyoming and uh, I guess come back whenever I can. Impressive. Doc, your turn. <laughs> so uh, my name is Doc Wiley. I, this is my 30th year in music business. Uh, I'm a second uh, generation musician. My son's a third, unfortunately, even though I tried to talk him out of it. Uh, uh, I started off uh, as an intern. Uh, I went in and did a session. Uh, my father was on. This is how I got started in engineering and producing. So I'm 18 years old. I'm in a logarithmic class on engineering. <laughs> we were studying logarithms. And uh, uh, two days before, I, my father called me and said, this guy's an idiot, and we have Cozy Cole, who was Duke Ellington's drummer, and he doesn't know what he's doing. Will you come in here and put, you know, set it up and record it? I said, okay. So I went in there and did what pretty much came natural to me, uh, is by when I don't know something, I ask somebody who knows a lot. So I went to Cozy Cole, who had been making records since the cylinder, and said, how would you like me to mic your drum set? And he said, well, I don't know, Junior. Why don't you put your ear there, and if it sounds good, put a mic there. I've used that my whole career. Um, fast forward a, a little way later, I became a bass player, working bass player, for about 12 or 13 years later. and. Uh, uh, in, uh, at the age, the ripe old age of 33 years old, I uh, got an internship at DigiDesign, where I worked for free for eight months. I got coffee, I got pizza orders, and then uh, within two months, they gave me the keys to the kingdom, and that night I could come in and have my way with the machines. When I was done with that internship, and, now, and by the way, all of my grown folk friends made fun of me for working for free. Uh, when I won the Grammy, by the way, I called them all and said, Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> so, particularly a girl. Who was I might have had a little experience with this myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I worked for free, did it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, when I was done with the internship, they liked what I did a whole lot. I knew, a guy, I knew uh, the owner of Island Records, Chris Blackwell, and uh, a guy that worked for him, Joe Galdo. They offered me a position at Island Records. So I went from being an intern to engineering, being a house engineer at Island Records. Did that for about five years. They were a digital guy. 
um, and learned a lot. Uh, the truth of the matter is, in my, in my opinion, is, is that in the music business, you make your job. You see a need, and you become an expert in that, and they will put you to work. I am a digital expert. I can do all things digital. And I've been doing it so for 15 some odd years. So I would say that for you. Find something that, you're, that you like a lot and become an expert at it. And people will be drawn to you, right? At the time, when I got that job at Island Records, uh, there was four people on the planet that knew what I knew. Right? And so, uh, my first job was with David Lee Roth. I worked for him for two years. Uh, a year in, when they all felt comfortable, I started working with U2 and Prince, and just one after another. And the reason was is that the old time engineers and producers were like, this Pro Tools thing will never last. Uh, digital recording will never last. Tape will last forever. And it wasn't true. The truth is, is that digital was the future. And so when the artists started looking for better ways to work, they needed somebody. And Chris would go, I got a guy in Miami. And he would fly me to New York, to Prince's studio, to do cool digital stuff with them. So I would say to you that, uh, you know, so from here to now, I have one Grammy, two Grammy, no three Grammy nominations, 15 platinum records, 10 gold records. I've worked with anybody from Whitney Houston to Christina Aguilera. MJ. Huh? MJ. Yeah, I did work with MJ. I worked with uh, uh, the Wu-Tang Clan to Third Eye Blind. I've gotten to work with the best artists in the world. And I didn't do it uh, in any other way but finding a niche and working that niche and being not the smartest guy in the room but the m most researched guy in the room. The guy who's most prepared in the room. And that took me a long way. So, and I end up here and I work with him. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, we take, a lot of the divide takes interns as well. Um, but one of his interns is my business partner in Live from the Divide. So you see how that works? You know, so you too uh, can do the same thing. Um, my name is Jeremiah Slovarp, and uh, I, I work at Peach Street Studios. I'm also faculty here at MSU in the music school. Um, I teach uh, three classes at the music school, entertainment business, sound for film and television, and recording too. Uh, and those are, in a, those are as an adjunct in addition to what I do at Peach Street. Uh, to get started how I got into this business, I was an economics major. Graduated in 2001 with a degree in econ here at Montana State University. All the while, I was taking courses at the film school because I had found a clever little loophole that if, I, that if you weren't a film major, you weren't subject to the gate. So you could take film classes. So I was taking uh, Sound for Film at the time, my mentor was Dave Kester. Uh, he moved on to work for a number of different animation houses, and he went on to go get his PhD in, in animation from the University of Hong Kong, where he taught for a while before coming back to the States. And he m mentored me my way through the initial phases of the business, and I'm very thankful for that. Right out of college, I was still playing in, in a bunch of rock and roll bands with my buddies. And two of those buddies, Orion and Luke, at the time, we had amassed a large amount of equipment playing in rock and roll bands. You want to go play in a band, you got to go to the bar and set up your gear. The bar doesn't have your gear, you got to bring your own. So we would take the money from our van gigs and we would buy equipment. And we would spend all of the, the money, I was a complete Nazi about it, I would take all the money from the band and I would buy the band's equipment. And we would amass uh, a large amount of equipment by the time this was done. There came a point right after I graduated where I said, look at all this equipment we have. We have no place to put it other than our gigs, and we can really do some cool things with this. 
as I was coming into that phase, I had also started working on a bunch of, on location, on a bunch of film and television shows. And there was a gentleman named TC who uh, showed the way to working on location as a boom operator or a sound mixer, sound recorders for film and television shows. And I thought that was really cool. I liked being on a set and it was just a lot of fun. So me and my two partners, we collected all of our gear and we opened our first studio, Jericho Studios, and that was over in the, uh, what's now today the Bonton Flower Mills on uh, Peach and Wallace. I stayed there for six years before moving into Peach Street Studios about six and a half, maybe seven years ago now, and that being my second installation, uh, I have amassed a um, wide range of credits and, uh, and, and staff employees and interns. How many in this room actually have interned for me already? One, two, did you ever intern or were you just an employee? You were just an employee. Okay, so I have two ex-interns in here and one still current employee. Some of you will probably move on to, to apply for internships, which I do encourage. Um, and, you know, the things that we move into will be mostly live sound and, and concert and concert sound, which leads me to my next thing, how I've stayed in business for this long. And that was, a diver that was diversity. I couldn't just make it in on a TV set. There weren't enough TV shows that came to Montana. I couldn't just make it in the studio. Most bands are completely <coughs> broke and can't afford to record a record. True. But what I was able to do was say, hey, I can work with bands in the studio. I can work with concerts and productions. I can work on TV shows. A lot of the equipment is the same. And that diversity really garnered me some, some, good, some good jobs. My very first paying job was a film and TV show called The, Wild, uh, the, the Wildest Dream. And I was lucky enough to have an old family contact with Tom Brokaw. Uh, he agreed to be my narrator for the film, and the film went on to win the best film on climbing at Banff Mountain Film Festival. That was my very first paid gig. From there, I was able to create contacts with a variety of other film and TV shows, and today I get to work for Disney, doing the voice of Eeyore. Not myself, but Bud Lucky comes in and records uh, the voice of Eeyore. Uh, the voice of ER. Uh, I get to work with another fantastic actor in town named Philip Winchester. He's been on uh, Flyboys and Camelot. He's currently the star of HBO's series Strike Back, uh, and we ADR all of that. Uh, this is I've ADR my 40th episode, four seasons uh, for Strike Back, where you take the dialogue on the film, you hit delete, and then you re-record all the lyric, all the dialogue, and you try and match it to the lips you see on the screen. So when you're watching, when you're in, the worst part is the airplane cut. So when you're on the airplane and you're watching those the, the cheesy airplane cuts where they cut all the swear words out and the lips don't match, that's me doing that. <laughs> uh, it's very fun. Uh, but we do this for entire episodes and, and uh, it's, it's quite a good time. And so we, you know, I progressed through a variety of different realms, uh, including symphony. Uh, Matthew was brave enough to hire me when I was very young and still had hair. And uh, You had hair? True. <laughs> Uh, to do sound for his symphony in the Summer Symphony Pops concerts back in 2002, I think it was, perhaps. And uh, uh, he's somehow kept me around since then, uh, along with some other, some other long-term clients that both have been like Sweet Pea Festival, or Music on Main, or Music in the Mountains. How many of you have been to Sweet Pea or Music in the Mountains, Music on Main? Yeah, a lot of you. All of those events are staffed and serviced by my company. And those are the events that most of the interns that we take end up on. And it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy what I do. And uh, as far as music goes, considering this is a what can you do with a music degree uh, workshop, uh, not having a music degree, I think Matthew could speak for the for the musician side of it, but I could certainly speak for the uh, for some of the management side. I even brought a list of notes right out of class for those of you who haven't had my uh, my entertainment business class. But there's a variety of different career paths that you can take if I can find them. Um, as a musician, you can go into performance and work with awesome conductors like Matthew, on stage, off stage, recording. You can be a composer, an engineer, in live, studio, broadcast, location, or a mastering engineer. You can be an arranger, a producer, a teacher. Uh, you can work in agency, you can work as a conductor, uh, you can work as equipment management doing repair, maintenance, cataloging, uh, logistics, uh, rock and roll shows. How many of you have driven by the field house and seen you know, an entire team of semi-trucks at a concert, like Zach Brown Band that's gonna be here in a, in a day, okay? 
They'll bring in 19 semis. They will be packed from front to back, top to bottom, with lighting, sound, video equipment, and then we'll take a team of probably 150 people to unpack those trucks and build that set. Um, that's what you can do with a music major. There's a lot of other things. I have a huge list here if you're interested, but um, those are just a, a couple items. I, I need to get that list from you for a <laughs> <laughs> resource guide. Um, I'm sure you guys have questions for these guys. Let's open it up to the audience and <coughs> ask what you really want to know. Billy, not a question. <laughs> what is the value of grad school in this business? How necessary is it to go and get a master's or a doctorate? Depends on what you what what you want to do. Uh, there's so, there's many many more things than what Jeremiah just mentioned. And um, in my case, I'm a performing artist primarily. Uh, <coughs> if I basically for a conductor, you have once you become a conductor, you have two two distinct options, and then a lot of variation within those options. But you can go the professional route or the academic route. Uh, in in my line of work, we're told if we want to be professional conductors, do not get a doctorate. Grad school, master's degree is critical, but do not get a doctorate because perception is reality as a performing artist in the classical music industry. And the feeling is uh, we don't want academicians on the podium with professional orchestras. That, I don't agree with it. I'm just saying that's sort of the way it is. Do not get a doctorate because you're then in academia for too long. You're not out there starving and, and experiencing music and, and our version of interning, which is just showing up and begging to observe and hang out and make coffee if they ask you and hope somebody gives you a chance at some point, you know. Uh, if you want to go into academia, you need, you need a doctorate unless you become famous. You know, if you're famous, they don't care. You, they figure you have enough professional experience. But a lot of people go right out of their doctorates into academia, academic jobs. Um, so, but I would say that um, probably in any profession nowadays, a master's degree is critical. I mean, a bachelor's degree now is is just really a starting point, I think. Master's degree is when you really get a chance to really focus. And for me, that's what I took away from it. I mean, my master's degree, I was there to be an orchestra conductor, period. And 24-7, I must have slept six hours a week because I was there to learn. 24-7, I was studying orchestra conducting and everything there was to study about it. Um, so I think in, in music in general now, I mean, you know, there's, I'm not saying it's possible, it's not possible to make it without a degree. Of course it is, but it's much harder, you know, yeah. forge your own path, you know. So I would uh, uh, dovetail with that also to say that, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, what allowed me to kick down the door as an engineer and producer is the fact that I was a working musician. Uh, most of my peers uh, are not musicians. Which, interestingly enough, I find is true with a lot of teachers. Yeah. Music teachers sort of stop performing. Right. And I, I think that's awful. It's yeah. just terrible because they lose complete touch with what it is to be on stage and all the complexities that come with that. Exactly. Including the main point of music, which is how to communicate it somehow to people. Right. You know, it just, it's just not going to happen because you go out and play. Either there's, there's a lot of a craft to that. So I, I'm with you on that. I think the other thing that's, that's prudent when, when you're thinking about this you know, life in music, why you want to get a, a upper degree of some sort is because those tools, those really kind of Byzantine factoids that you'll bring to the table with a higher degree are so useful because we've already uh, used up all the general knowledge, right? And so when you're, when you're either collaborating, you know, I worked on uh, Lord of the Rings, Twin Towers, with Howard Shore. So there we were in Miami uh, with Howard Shore. We were hooked up to uh, Abbey Road, <coughs> and, and at the same time, Auckland, New Zealand, right? We're all on ISDN talking to each other. And we're editing in real time. I'm editing what Howard wants me to do. Uh, in real time, uh, we were doing a piece, and I, I, I think I mentioned this to Jeremiah, we were editing a piece called Rohan. And the issue was that uh, it was done in two different spaces. They had lost the Royal Albert Hall and had moved the recording in the middle of the piece to uh, a church in North London. Luckily, they had gotten the same guy who had done a lot of the uh, classical work, I 
think on Victor, I could be wrong, but, but London Victor, and he had closed mic everything. But the guy in Abbey Road was not a musician. So he couldn't uh, follow along on the chart and go, oh, oh, that's where we're going to edit, right there. Now, I am not a great reader of music, but I can read. <laughs> so I was able to go, oh, yeah, we're just going to go to that B flat part right there. Cool. And went right to it. So what I'm saying is, is that uh, by you kind of having this extra information that interests you and getting these degrees that interest you, when you're put into these circumstances, you know, a year before, no one, if someone told me, oh, you're going to work on, you know, Lord of the Rings, I'd go, you're insane. You know, but what happened is Howard's, uh, Howard Short's father got sick, so he had to come to Miami, and we ended up working together. So I would say in those type of situations, the more knowledge you have, the more specialized you are, the, the more opportunities are available to you. Let me just throw in two final thoughts on this from my perspective. One is specialized is the word. Grad school gives you the opportunity to do that. So you're not taking a massive credit course load of all kinds of diverse courses. If grad school is your chance to draw it into a, a more of a, a microscopic focus. But secondly, whether you go to grad school or not, the one big mistake that I see people time and time, day after day make, is they get their bachelor's degree and they think they're done. They stop growing. Right? And if you don't continue to grow your whole life, you will not succeed in any profession, but especially one as complicated as music. To, to, I mean, there's very few job opportunities anymore. If you want to, I mean, here I am, I've got 25 years on the road, I've conducted over 40 orchestras in the United States. Uh, I have a name in, in, in certain countries in Europe. I've done very well for myself, and all of a sudden my business changed in the last five years to decide that orchestras around the country uh, are no longer interested in hiring anybody over the age of 34. Just like that, overnight. So now I have to reinvent myself yet again. If I'm not willing to keep my mind open and continue to ed be educated and continue to go out and seek that education, it's over. Any other questions? So we've talked a lot about how it's been finding that niche where you can put yourself in to make your work for yourself. What do you guys see as an important field that is needed right now, but you don't see enough people? You're a violist. <laughs> <laughs> you play viola, you work. <laughs> you know? That's very practical. Right? That's that is practical. Right. A direct path. I think, uh, look, I think I'm even though I'm old. <laughs> I would say that uh, one of the things that I've always been a progressive thinker. So to me, media 2.0, 3.0 is where I'm heading. How do we deliver the great content that we can create, right? Delivery <coughs> systems are important. You know, even in how we do Live in the Divide, it's not a typical radio show. It's based off of media 3.0 thinking. And so what I would say to you is that, first of all, until you, once you get your degree, the next thing is start to intern with various different people. You know, by the time that I was working at Island, they were sending me off with different people to kind of kind of shadow them. Some of the, you know, I went to Dobie Labs. I went to I just went to all of these different places that they paid me to kind of shadow people to come up with new concepts. Right? As a young person, you have the opportunity to intern. So intern with me. Intern with him. Intern I'm, with Jeremiah. I'm glad he brings this up because I think a lot of people, another mistake people make is they get their bachelor's degree and they expect that company to come on campus and just hire them. And that, really, how rare is that, really? Absolutely. Uh, no, never. I, mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is yeah. that you're not going to get out of school and have a condo and a, and a beach house and a snowmobile overnight. I slept on a futon until I was 39 years old. I was conducting all over the world. I was getting $6,000 a night, but I had so much debt, I had to pay that off. But I still, when everybody, I had this thing with my brothers where I wanted to just get a job. In right. those years, I was training for grad school, okay? Right. Um, and I got all that, too. And then I take a job for 16 grand a year with no benefits. Everybody thought I was crazy, right. you know? Well, three years later, I'm signing with management, and my career's taking off. You know, it's a question of, I mean, White House interns are the guys who study. Look at all the people in history who, White House, who were White House interns who end up like Secretary of State right. 30 years later. So I think... 
there's that continual investment you have to make after you graduate. And if you don't make that, then you really cut yourself off the knees. And I would say, too, is think of it as a buffet. How can you say that you like squash if you've never had it on the buffet? You know, uh, oh, what job should I get in? I don't know. What job have you tried? You know, there's lots of, look, I, you know, there was a time my father was an amazing jazz bassist. He was a jazz professor. Amazing man. And there was a time that I thought, oh, I'll be a studio musician. I hate studio musicianing, where you show up and play commercials. And I hate that. Okay? But I tried it. Right? Now, Plus, if you're going to get through the door, you've got to have a way to get through the door. Right. So, you know, making coffee for a little while for the guys that have the key to the door isn't a bad idea because I've had interns that have been very impressive. Right. They didn't complain, they just were happy to be there, they were happy to learn whatever. And then when they're up for grad school or some job, I'm like all over making sure they get that, doing whatever I can. I've had interns that had a chip on their shoulder and I'm happy to not answer calls about asking for references for them, you know what I mean? So I'm really glad you brought this up because I think it's important. How many of you in here know some past music tech graduates like Dan Haywood? Maybe you do. Uh, what about uh, Dodge Kramer? Any of you guys know him? Yeah. Both Dodge and Dan interned with me. Uh, both of them all work for me. Uh, I would never have hired them had they not interned for me, had they not suffered through, you know, the pain that I put them through on live shows. We go out, we'll leave at noon, we will get home at 2 a.m. Let's get even more day. practical. I get hordes of resumes all the time. They all look fabulous. Everybody's fabulous, right? Until you've had them for three months and you find out who they really are. So I don't hire anybody, ever, that I either don't know or somebody I trust didn't know. Do you know what I mean? So think about that. That's the importance of interning. Not just to learn, not just to see options and to explore different things, but to have some connections, that important network connections to people who really can bust down barriers for you. I think that's, uh, if I could say, is that where you talk about six degrees of separation in the music business, it's one. Mm -hmm. You want to get to Bono? It's one, me. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have management number. I can call him right now. So, um, so in the music business, it's... Can I get to Eeyore? <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> and I think that's cooler, actually. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the thing you think about. It's about relationships. What we do is about relationships. We're not like bankers. Like, you can pretty much hate somebody in banking like I hate you to death and still do banking with them. And they can be a good banker. And they can be a great banker. But I, if, he, if I think he's not a very nice person, we can't do good work together. It's just an impossibility. Because the work environment is so unusual and stressful, and as Jeremiah said, there's nights you're there till four in the morning, right. and you just can't have a drama queen on, on, at work with you, you know? I will tell you that conductors like myself talk all the time, and one of the key questions we ask each other on the phone is, who did you have last year's guest soloist that you won't have again? That's scary. It's, it's one of the key questions, yeah. and I can literally, even myself in my mid-level career, can doom a person by one on one phone call because that's going to get around so fast. And I've had a few people that came here with a chip on their shoulder, thought, "Oh, exposed man, I don't need to really bring my A game." And um, I've told conductors about that. and other conductor, we look out for each other because who needs a week of work with a drama queen who's not going to do the job really well with with the kind of work that we do which sometimes means you don't get to punch out at 5 o'clock. Because, oh my god, we didn't expect this to happen today, but we got to stay till midnight, right? Any other questions? I want to come back to Josh's question for a second about uh, gaps. And one of the things that Doc was talking about is new delivery systems. So ever since Napster killed the music business, right? Ever since Napster killed the music business, uh, record labels are collapsed. There's no revenues from record labels whatsoever. You know, you've got a couple of record labels out there that still exist. They only do artist development on the one or two artists. It used to be a 20 to 1 ratio. You invest in 20 artists, you get one hit. That was the ratio. Now, they invest in one or two artists, and they get one or two hits, because they throw all their eggs into one basket, into one big media buy and one big media pool. Those two artists go on the radio, and those are your hits. They're manufactured now. Hits are manufactured. They're not invested. A&R is dead. Uh, so, new business opportunities and holes for people to make money in this business in an administrative side is finding revenue streams. 
okay? Not necessarily being a musician, but if you weren't a musician and you can't speak the music language, you can't push the music down the correct avenue. And there are certainly opportunities to do that. If you can find a way to monetize your music through the, the next Facebook, or the next Twitter, or the next Live from the Divide, if you can find a way to monetize that, whether it be through interaction, or advertising, or flat sales, something like that, <coughs> you're going you're gonna to continue to make some money there. The other avenue is going to be through legal services. Ever since the demise of the record label, all the old entertainment lawyers are still stuck on 1970s copyright law. The new copyright law, well not the new copyright law, but the, with the changes in digital domain and copyright and streaming that's happening today, it's very different. Copyright, only, copyright law really only pertains to one of the old copyright laws, and that was a, a new addition called digital streaming in a non-exclusive digital format. And if you can extract on that, if law school was your thing and you like books and, and contracts and enforcement and being an agent and breaking down doors and saying, pay what you owe, maybe going into legal services on behalf of musicians is good for you as well. Uh, and that's beyond being a performing musician or, or a, digital, uh, a digital musician. I would say what I call it, too, is, is what I call an American artisan entrepreneur. This is the era that we're in now. American artisan entrepreneur. That means that you're a small business owner. I have a band, I'm a songwriter, I'm a, I make music for commercials, I make da, 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 da. whatever I make, it's my business, it's my cottage industry, it's mine, right? And you <coughs> have to learn the pathways as a business person, how to take your small business and maximize your commodity, i.e. music, right? Whether it's just collecting it, or whether it's composing it, whatever it is, and monetizing that for your small business. And to me, it's the golden age. You know, for me, I have a chip on my shoulder. My father was signed to Chess Records from 47 to 55. They still owe my family money. The other, uh, about four years ago, a buddy of mine from England sends me a box set of Chess Records, right? Every song ever recorded in Chess Records. There was 12 songs on that. My family didn't see any money for that. It was in a beautiful package. It was a $200 box set. I didn't see any money for that. My dad, who was you know, uh, close to death at that point, we, you know, that would have been helpful for him. And so what I would say to you is that why anymore give your power to someone else? Keep your small business. A university is a perfect place for you to own that stuff. Hey, why not take a business class? Why not take, uh, you know, thing? have these tools so at least you know what expert to tap to help you do what you need to do. Does that make sense? Any of you trying to figure about a career as a performing artist? S smart, we got okay too. I will tell you that I got some of the best training in the world for what I do. And I only learned in that training about 17% of what I actually needed to know to do the work. He's dead on, he's dead on accurate. But my, my first advice would be take a good writing class because you're going to need to write. Period. Uh, a business class is smart. You're going to need to give speeches. You're going to need to communicate through your website or whatever, all these things. I think he's dead on right. If you want to be a performer, this is the time for you to not sleep and take as many classes as possible and whatever loans you need to take to study whatever you need to study to get all those tools in your toolbox because I can tell you that when I got out, I quickly, I won a job pretty quickly out of school and I found out that how little I knew. I mean, I knew how to conduct. I knew how to choose musicians and I knew how to train musicians and that's about 17% of my job, so. At the end of the day, you still have to attempt to pay rent and pay your own bills, however small you can make them and you know, generating that income or finding you know, ways to to go down that path is very important. If you can find a business student or a marketing student or someone that you can partner up with early on at this stage, even if it's a short-lived marriage, okay? Uh, partnerships don't always last. Sometimes they're very short-lived, a month or two, and you realize we can't work together. Sometimes they'll last for years, like uh, my current partner Luke and I, we've been together in Jericho Studios since 2002 and it's worked very well. But if you can find some people to work with early on who are very good at what they do, specialized, focus on what it is that you do very well, 
help them focus on what they do very well. If they're really good at business and writing up business plans or reviewing a contract, writing a contract and submitting it to the buyer, you know, making sure that you know, Brett down at the Zebra has a contract in writing so that your band can go play. You didn't want to write the contract, but they might have been really good at that. Let them write the contract. You know, let them earn a little bit on that contract enforcement. Or you know, if you're a, uh, a performing musician, make sure that the performing, you know, the per performing musicians you know, get their fair share if, you know, if that's what you can do. Or make, at least look out for yourself and make sure that you're able to get your own fair share. And if partnering up with you know, good, trustworthy, hardworking people who are specialized in their you know, specific disciplines can really help you along the way. Uh, don't, it's a whole lot harder to do this alone. You know, I would say to you, uh, look, the truth of the matter is that anytime you go into the arts, whatever that arts is, there are certain touchstones that you will mo either will be delayed in your life or you will miss them completely. You will probably be delayed in, in buying a home. You will probably be delayed in getting a new car. You will probably, uh, you know, you will probably push off having a family until you're stable. All of those things you will probably do and sacrifice in doing what you want to do. Just describe my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 47 and, and have a six month old. It's my first child. I wasn't able to buy a home until I was 40. And I was conducting major orchestras for 15 years before I was able to buy a home. But it was all because of the investment I had made uh, and the little return I got. But you know, I, I'll tell you what, the one thing I can tell you about my life is that I, I paid off every penny I borrowed to become a conductor by actually being a conductor. And so the guys I went to high school with had boats and snowmobiles when they were 25. I'm 47, I still don't have one, I don't care. I'm totally pleased with that. But yes, you're dead on right. You have to accept the fact that you're, you're gonna see the guys you went to high school with all having buying their weekend homes and stuff, and you're gonna still be sleeping on a futon. Um, because it's just hard. It's just, in music, in whatever aspect of music or performing arts as you are expected to have about as much knowledge and training, the equivalent of a neurosurgeon. But you're never going to make that bread unless you want to like, in classical music there's like six guys that are millionaires. Maybe 12, you know, and then there's the rest of us, okay? But I'm at a point now where I make a nice living and I have a nice home and I have a six month old who probably I'm going to be able to afford to put through college and if I keep working at the way I am, so I have no complaints. But you're, you're right, you have to just accept that the stuff that your buddies are getting, because they got a law degree, you're not going to get. Right. And I think the other thing too is that, and I came to this knowledge late. Uh, here I've, uh, <clears throat> I have either the luxury and blessing or the curse of everything that I actually put my mind on, I actually achieved. But that cost was at the people who cared about me. It wasn't just me sacrificing. You know, my own son, he's a grown man, and we were in the studio, and uh, it was a year after I won the Grammy, and he looks over to me and he goes, you're Captain Ahab. And I realized that he sacrificed just as much as I did to get that Grammy, because I wasn't there. I was working all the time. I was achieving. I was overachieving trying to uh, achieve something that no one else in my family had done, and no one else had done in particular thing. I was innovating, I was trying to innovate my way into the record books because at the time, uh, particularly in Latin music where I, where I was working at the time, no one was using digital recording the way I did. And I innovated, but it was at a sacrifice to people who cared about me. No dinners, birthday dinners, you know, what was I doing, I was working. As long as we're talking about sacrifices, um, very early, very early on, this was right after my first summer doing live sound. Uh, how many of you have heard of a band called Gogo Bordello? A couple of you. All right. So I went on the road with them for eight weeks on Vans Warp Tour. I was a front of house engineer. Uh, for eight weeks, I slept on a sleeper car with 16. I was one of 16 people on a sleeper car. There were 72 tour buses just for the people on the road. Okay. So 72 times 16. That was the crew. And there was, you know, a variety of bands in each of the buses. And for eight weeks, you know, I was lucky to get a shower once every other day if the stadium we were playing in had a sports locker. Um, we smelled awful. Um, it was, the hours were heinous. You know, you would sleep odd hours, take naps whenever you could. You would sleep through, you know, part of the, 
late night through the early morning until you arrived the next morning at your destination. Then you would get off the bus, build the whole set, stage show, and then tear the whole thing down and do it again every day for eight weeks. And the, the upside to that is I had no expenses. They, you know, I got paid. The money went straight to my bank account. I couldn't spend it because I was on the road working constantly. Uh, and so I had no expenses, my food, my board, and all that was taken care of. The downside was, as far as sacrifices go, I had no girlfriend, I had no life outside of the tour, I had no dog, I had no home, I had nothing. I lived on a tour bus. And if you had to do it over again, would you? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would lose all my hair again doing that. You know? And I would do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would <laughs> trade the experiences that I've had uh, and, and moments that I've been in the room you know, I wouldn't trade them. You know, those are the sacrifice. Those, that's the payoff. You know, Whitney Houston kissed me at at the end of a mix I did. Where? Here. Oh, Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs> Leave her alone. <laughs> now, Bobby, you can just say crazy stuff about it. As long as you've watched it since. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I agree with him 100%. I think that's, that's the situation you guys have to think about. Look, I'm not trying to, I, me personally, I'm not trying to scare you, but I do want you to have a realistic concept of what you're going to do. The, the other thing I would say to you very clearly is, is that. You know, in my family, um, you know, being all academics and me kind of going off to being a musician and all that wackiness, one of the things that, you know, just has always done me well is being an autodidact. Does everybody know what that means? It means someone who's self-teaching. I'm always searching. I'm always, before I came here, I went to the thrift store and bought a bunch of books. I'm always reading, I'm always watching documentaries, I'm always looking at great art, I'm always doing it, I'm always being influenced. I'm always trying to stretch the boundaries of my creativity, always. Not sometimes, always. And the poor women in my life have to deal with me always obsessing with all oh, the nudist art or oh, we gotta go see a Frank Lloyd Wright house, you know, or something like that, because I want to be inspired so that I can put that in my craft. Does that make sense? And you have to have that same, in Latin, it's called ganas, desire, right? You gotta have the desire for that thing. And you may not even know what it is, but it's, you know, for me, uh, a great story I have is, I read a, a, a guy who knew everything about Michelangelo, everything. So all of his sculptures, a normal sculpture goes around the, the, the granite and chisels away. Michelangelo was this amazing artist that he went one way, like the image coming out of a bath, because he approached it as you know, it was coming out of a bath. That was his imagery when he was carving these amazing art. I have used that same thinking process when I've mixed a record. Can I pull it out of the, this flat surface and have it poke out like it's coming out of a bath? So I'm being influenced by the greats. You know, my favorite artist is Pollock. You know, I just like the splashing and the silliness and. But at the same time, it's, if you stand in front of one of Pollock's, you go to the Met in New York, and you stand in front of a Pollock, which is gigantic, by the way. It's not small painting. It's, you know, 15 feet, 20 feet tall. It will put a blanket around you. It, it's not, you may see it and go, it's just some guy splashing some paint on there. But for me, I just go, wow, that's amazing. And I get all jazzed about it. So that's what I would say. Find stuff you love, poets like Rumi or whoever. Find stuff you like and just just know everything about them. You know, that's what I would I think we have time for one more question. Um, <clears throat> you were saying uh, you weren't working, you were working for free for eight months. I was wondering if there's technical skills or talents you had during that time that you would use to kind of get a day job. Well, the truth be known, uh, the reason why at the, the in tender age of 33, why I was able to take eight months off, is actually I had bought Apple stock 
three years earlier, and it, <coughs> and it split twice. And so I took two years off, and that was a part of my plan. So, um, see, I'm smarter than I look. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so, but it was a plan of mine. I had I inherited a small amount of money. I put it in Apple, and then it split twice. And then I had enough money to live, you know, pay my apartment, have some food, put some gas in my motorcycle. So before I moved here, I rode motorcycles, and uh, and go to the intern the internship, and then get started at Island. So that's what I was able to do. So here's the truth. Again, without the support of people who care about me, my mother uh, leaving me a little money to invest into something. I would not have been able to avail myself of that opportunity of working for digital design as an intern. Does that make sense? So if your parents or your aunt or a good friend says, look, I got you while you're doing that internship, take it. Don't be proud and go, oh, I got this. Uh, no, take it because then I was able to totally focus on that internship. You know, and like I said, I to this day, you know, I'll get coffee, water, for anybody I'm working with. I am not, you know, uh, always keep it humble. He gets it for me. I do. I know you had a question. Yeah, um, it was actually, I guess, directed towards you. I'm interested in going into, like, concert production. And I was wondering, I'm an engineering major. Um, I was wondering, like, first stepping stones, I guess, is, like... Go to the field house, sign up as field crew, and... Yeah load in for, for example, the Zach Brown band tomorrow, or what is it, next week, uh, load, load up for that, and you'll be part of the stage crew loading gear on wheels and, and boxes, and pay attention to a number of different things, how they build the stage on the ground, uh, the weight loading, how they, how they load up all the weight, and then look up, and look at what they fly from the ceiling, and that's where you'll apply your engineering degree. In fact, that's a very good job market right now, is uh, a rigor. Oh, yeah. Very good job market, it's very dangerous, uh, it's high pay, uh, you're usually off the ground 50 to 70 feet. Um, it requires a license, a rigorous license. At least the master rigor for a show requires a license. Uh, and you also have to learn how to um, hang out in a harness or other things off the ground a lot. Uh, but you learn all about, are you a civil engineer, mechanical? I was civil, I'm in construction now. Okay, so at least from the mechanical engineering side, what you're gonna be looking at is uh, weight loading, chain motors, you know, dead hangs on points and uh, bridles, saddles, and all that kind of stuff, where you're hanging, you know, 40, 50,000 pounds on a roof. Uh, the field house holds 50,000 pounds without a snow load. Uh, you, if it's not snowed outside, you can get the civil engineer for the university to sign off on an additional 30,000 pounds. When we had Van Halen here at MSU, they wanted to hang 72,000 pounds. We couldn't do it. We had to cut back about 40,000 pounds because it had snowed. Uh, we hung 70 one-ton chain motors, though we didn't put that much weight on the roof. And it's a very cool thing to see from an engineering standpoint because you have to make all the chain motors walk the grid and go up all at the same time so that the speakers, the sound, the truss, the lighting, the TV screen, everything comes up off the deck at exactly the same time or the system unbalances and you can pull the roof down and kill people. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all seen you know, the, the, the accidents that happened over the past couple of years in the summertime when you know, a tornado comes ripping through a, a concert and a stage collapses. Okay. I seem to recall doing an outdoor show one summer at Big Sky, and uh, at the dress rehearsal, the blizzard came through, and the speaker towers that were set out where the audience would be sitting collapsed over. No. And I might have had a little panic attack on that one. Do you remember that? And I was like, dude, dude, you got to fix that. Remember that? that was when he was just starting. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a through, and these, these massive speaker columns that were literally in the middle of where the crowd would be just went toppled. We would have had like lawsuit and, yeah. and then he fixed it. But that's not an easy thing to do. You gotta anticipate everything, yeah. right? I, um, I'm so lucky that no one's here to bust me. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not busting out of line. That's, that's, that's why people in your line of work, we need you guys around. Yeah. I, I think the other thing that you might want to consider too is that if you're not, uh, if you don't play an instrument, maybe study acoustic. Uh, and how it also affects uh, structures. Um, you know, uh, I was lucky enough to, uh, when Frank Gehring was building the uh, New World Symphony uh, space in, on South Beach, 
I was lucky to sit down on a couple conferences with him. And his guy, uh, his engineer, had done, had, had went back to school to study acoustics so that he understood how to build it where it would do the things that Frank Deering was wanting to do. So it's something for you to consider. You can study, you can get your master's or your doctorate in acoustics. That's a, usually a division of mechanical engineering. Actually, acousticians, it's a big market. Yeah. Yes, it's huge. Uh, when, when we're building buildings. Okay. We're not building buildings since the economy tanked in 2008, but I think that's coming back. But, right. uh, you know, you, I've, I've, looked, I've been a part of some projects that we're going to build buildings and look at the fees that we're going to be charged by the major acoustician firms. And wow. Yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah. Maybe you do get that house early. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll have Robin wrap everything up for us today. Well, first, before I wrap stuff up, if you guys want to thank the panel for the day. And this is across all majors, so it's not music specific, but it's still worth noting. Um, it's kind of, this is a pretty linear graph. It makes it's probably nothing unexpected, but it's equivalencies of degrees um, and earnings. So the higher you go, um, the more you're going to make. I mean, I don't think that's going to surprise anybody. Um, we have our we do collect survey data from um, MSU students when they graduate this year. It's called the Career Destinations. We have these booklets in our office if you are interested. Um, we have a pretty decent response rate. The majority of students um, do report being employed or in grad school full time. Um, almost 15% are employed part time. Only 5% are unemployed and don't are not in grad school, and 2% were not seeking employment. Uh, whatever that category is, he's poor, lucky enough. <laughs> um, so the types of organizations that employ MSU grads, um, the majority, obviously, almost half of it is in business and industry, and that would certainly apply to you. Um, and then education and healthcare are tied, and then everything else is much, um, much smaller. Um, so this is also pretty interesting. Almost every degree, um, the majority of students are able to stay in state. Um, do you think that might be different? I don't know. Typically, um, with the exception of engineering, which is almost actually at 50%. Um, this is probably the most relevant to you, and the panelists did mention this um, significantly today, so please do internalize this. Um, the internship, the majority, the biggest factor in securing a job is experience, and this is specifically related to your major in internship or co-op program. So they've said internships a million times, and I'm just going to reiterate that is crucial, and especially Considering this slide, um, the top way that a graduate found their job is they knew their employer or referred by somebody that the employer knew. Um, and I suspect from hearing today that that number is much higher for the music. So um, please, please, please think about it. it's networking, it's building your own brand, it's communicating with people, it's crucial, especially it sounds like in this field. Um, we, I'm gonna, we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip through these. Um, but some key points to take with you. I can thank you guys for saying this so often, but do an internship, and in this case, it sounds like multiple. This is really, and they're hit it right on the dot. You're not gonna know what you don't like to do if you don't do an internship, um, in, in addition to what you do like. And employers wanna know that. If you're able to go with experience and say, I've done this, I know I don't wanna do this, that's really important knowledge. So the more internships, especially here, um, the better. Um, communicate with your advisor that, again, communication, it's, all about um, long-term contacts. Um, use the services and tools that we have available for you. Um, and again, network. So thank you guys very much for coming and let's thank our panel again. <laughs>